Hey YouTube, it's Dimitri, and today we're gonna to talk about what I think is the optimal quantitative finance master's program in general. We're gonna talk about structure, we're gonna talk about different pieces I think they should have and shouldn't have, uh, but just to kick off here, right, for those of you that don't know who I am, I do a lot of videos on education and training. I actually work in quantitative finance. I have a master's. I've consulted with a variety of different financial engineering, quantitative finance, mathematical finance, computational finance programs. I've talked to their directors. I've talked to their students. I've done their interviews. I've been through part of a financial engineering program and a structure. I transferred out of it. I didn't like the way that it was structured, so I did not complete that one. I completed a different master's in applied economics, so I'll be completely open and transparent with you guys if you don't know. Um, and also I work in quant finance. I have some impact on the hiring process somewhat. So again, I'm not the one that's doing the hiring or the funding. Um, but when you come and you interview, you will interview with me if you go through anything that's on my team. So I have a pretty good grasp from you know going through the programs, advising students who are going to programs, networking with a lot of industry professionals across the field. Uh, I've consulted them and contacted from programs themselves on how they should structure new programs, uh, old programs, how they should revamp them. So again, I have somewhat a long history and background in the industry as well. So this all kind of puts together why I'm doing this. Uh, I absolutely hate ranking programs. I hate telling people if this program is a good program or a bad program. So today we're gonna go completely around that. So please don't ask any questions, even though I'm sure I'll have plenty of comments about it. But we're gonna talk about what I think is the optimal financial engineering, quantitative finance kind of program here. We'll use the terms fairly loosely. Um, let's just start off with here. I think the biggest sticking point for me, and the big sticking point is going to be what is a real master's? And by real master's, I mean which one is going to be an academic master's? And what's the difference between a professional degree? So these are very, very different. And people get very offended when I mention, for example, if you have an MBA, I don't think an MBA is a master's, right? And you say, oh, hold on, it's a master's in business administration. Think about that, right? Business administration, okay? It's not a actual academic master's. The title of it, again, says master's in it, um, but we'll cover why that's not really the case when we compare academic master's to professional degrees. So the first main difference here is going to be kind of the focus and the goal of what a academic master's is versus what a professional degree is, okay? Um, an academic master's should be theory-based. I consistently go to top-rated programs and talk to the students that graduate from them um, I've interviewed a few directors, for example, and talked to them. One of the biggest complaints I get from a lot of students is, Dimitri, I'm part of this master's, and of course these are masters that I think have great value. Uh, the students will say it is too theoretical. I want an applied master's, I want hands-on training, I wanna know how to do this in the industry. It is too theoretical. Um, so these are academic masters. They are highly focused, highly rigorous, trained on the math, stats, computer science, the tools you're going to need to do the job, but a lot of times they don't have a lot of hands-on application and focus. Uh, in comparison to this, a professional degree is more or less what I would call vocational school. So people are gonna be all upset, oh, vocational school, that's only for like tradesmen, right? No, vocational school is really just education and training specifically for one job. So you can go to vocational school, yes, for like trades, for example, right? It's education and training that trains you exactly how to do a very, very specific job. Um, but a lot of people don't realize there are a lot of jobs in the medical industry as well. Um, they're all called techs typically. So you have like, I don't know, x-ray techs, phlebotomists, all these sorts of things. Those are vocational schools. They're trained for a specific job. Okay, a professional degree, you can call it a master's if you want, like an MBA, it's really training you to do a specific job, a specific task. It's hands-on training. Um, one of the big things that differentiates professional degrees, for example, like MBAs, they bring in a lot of industry professionals. They try to get that hands-on training. They try to show you real-world cases, which is why they do all these case studies and MBA programs. You don't see this in an academic master's. The other difference I see for quantitative finance degrees is I think a solid master's, so again, if I made my own master's program, uh, it should be two years long. Should not be a year, should not be a year and a half, should not be nine months, 10 months, eight months, online. Should not be any of that nonsense. It should be two full years at a campus in a university. Okay. I think this is crucial. The online piece, I have a whole other <laughs> whole other issue with that. I'm not going to talk about that in this video, but it should be on campus. It should be two years. That's it. There's no shortcuts. There's no way out of it. It should be two years. We'll talk about credits here in a second. So it probably is likely you could do it in a year and a half, but I'm going to talk about kind of why it's not possible and why I don't recommend it. 
Okay, the other big difference here between academic masters and professional degrees, so professional masters, is that academic programs are very, very rigorous. So they're theory-based, as I mentioned. You're gonna learn things, for example, uh, like stochastic calculus. You shouldn't just take a stochastic calculus class and just blow through the class. You do a semester and you're done, you wipe your hands, all right, I'm all done with this, I don't want anything to do with it, I don't wanna get involved with it, and then I wanna hurry and go on to application. I think this is not the correct method. So you'll see here I'm in, in favor of an academic master's over a professional master's, but we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, the professional degree though is going to be very focused. So when I think about teaching, for example, stochastic calculus, I think it should be taught exactly as a math class should be taught, it's math. Um, you can use finance examples throughout the course to make it more applicable to the degree. I think that you should teach, again, more of a stochastic calculus processes finance, tying them together in multiple classes in here. Again, a perfect master's, a perfect education would be, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 years, but that's not feasible for anyone. And so you'll see here when I talk about the classes, trying to balance, again, that rigor with trying to cover as many topics as possible. Um, again, a professional degree would cover stochastic calculus for finance. It's an application only for finance. Um, this has a lot of advantages in many ways because you're specifically trained for a specific job. But again, you're not going to get the depth and the rigor. This comes down to every class. Those statistics should be statistical focused. Yes, you can use finance as examples. Yes, you can apply it to finance. But the rigor and the depth of these courses should be far, far deeper. And that leads me to my other point here on the difference between an academic master's and a professional master's here. Uh, an academic master's is going to require that you take three to four courses per semester. That's it. There's no more. You can't take more. Um, when I went to school, for example, in an academic master's, uh, you had to get permission to take more than that. And the majority of the students that requested it were rejected and denied. The reason for this is if you were taking the rigorous courses, the ones that are very challenging, that go very theoretical, the amount of homework, the amount of study time in those courses should only allow you as a full-time student to take three, maybe four courses. That's it. Um, again, professional degrees. So for example, going back to like an MBA as an example, um, you can take five, six classes. It's not really that big of a deal. You're not stretched too thin. That's a good amount of classes. The difference is you don't have as much homework. You don't have as much rigor and reading and research required for those courses because they're specifically applied, they're being taught. It's not going to be very rigorous. And a lot of quant programs out there today are more like professional degrees. They don't cover this in great depth. Um, again, if you're taking five or six classes in a semester, uh, this is a big red flag. The other piece here is going to be mentorship. So I think a master should have a mentorship as that's what academic masters actually have. Um, so again, when you go in, I'll give you an example here. My wife went for her master's and I went for my master's at the same time. Uh, I started in financial engineering. She was in kinesiology. Uh, I was very disappointed with my program because it's kind of like you're just thrown in and there's no academic mentorship. So what I mean by this is if you go and you get an academic degree, whether it's a master's or a PhD, uh, you're assigned an advisor. Your advisor is responsible for you. They're supposed to be there for support and help. They should help you with also being involved in academic research, which we'll talk about a little bit later and what I think should be in this quant masters here. Uh, again, you need that mentorship. You need someone that's assigned to you that's going to get hands on with like the education process, the learning, the job placement, which we'll talk about here in a second. Um, and this comes down to cohort size as well. So academic programs are going to have typically between like 30 and 50 students. Um, even that can be fairly large because if you have, you know, I don't know, 30 students, how do you get mentors for all of them? Uh, maybe you team up and have multiple people on one mentor. But again, you need to have the research and the resources for these individuals to really help these students hand on learning. Uh, again, my wife's program, she had probably one of the best, if not the best in the entire industry or the academic field of study that she was in. Um, she got amazing research opportunities. Uh, she worked with her one-on-one. -on -one. Her advisor was very hands-on, um, just as an example here as well, outside of kind of the academic realm. Um, we were there for Thanksgiving, right? Most students come from abroad. You don't have family around. What do you do on Thanksgiving? Uh, she invited over a lot of these graduate students to have dinner at her house. So again, there needs to be relationship building in these masters to be of great value. Um, on the flip side of this, professional degrees, I've seen ones with like 100 students, which is pretty small. Uh, I've seen ones with five, six, seven, eight, 900 students. Imagine having 900 cohorts. So you have one class, let's say class of 2021 here, and you have 900 students. 
You can't provide hands-on help. You can't provide the resources. You don't have everything you need to provide these people a very deep and rigorous academic study, like a career path here. So again, this is kind of one of these differentiating factors between an academic degree and a professional degree, right? They're just different. They have different things that they do better at than the other. So that's kind of the difference between an academic degree or an academic master's or a PhD, for example, uh, and a professional degree or a professional master's. Again, there's nothing wrong with a professional degree. I just don't think it prepares you very well for quantitative finance, okay? The reason for this is if you wanna really excel in quant finance, so it doesn't matter if you end up on the derivatives, so that's like the financial engineering side, and you're pricing exotic options and building models for this, for example, for like a hedge fund, um, or if you're on the other side of working like a me, so I work in risk management, building statistical models, um, you need to have a lot of academic tools. You need to have a very deep understanding of exactly what you're doing. Uh, you're gonna excel well in your career if you have all this set up for you. The unfortunate part is many of these programs that currently exist don't have this. There's not that system, that safety net, it's not built well, you don't have the academic rigor, and when I come across you in the industry, then we have to like basically hands-on train these people because they lack so much knowledge, and a lot of times we don't have the time to train you properly. So. In the long run, we're probably not gonna keep you. So it's kind of a challenge here. And this is why hiring, as I mentioned a lot, is so, so challenging, right? It's competitive, right? We get hundreds, if not thousands of applications for a job. And then out of those, right, I always tell people like we require a master's at minimum and a PhD is preferred. Again, I want the most rigorous education possible. If you went to a really, really good quantitative finance master's, right, thumbs up, I'm looking to hire people like you. If you went to something that was a professional degree, you're not gonna have the same rigor. You're not gonna be able to do the job without me training you an extensive amount on the job, and most companies don't wanna do that. So again, it's kind of a preference of what I see in the industry and why I prefer to have more of an academic masters out there. So let's go through the classes real quick on what I would structure it. Again, class titles don't mean a whole lot. I'm just trying to give you an idea of how I would balance a program, how I would structure it. Uh, that being said, right, every class, so even at like a professional degree versus a academic degree, um, you can balance these and have the same class titles, but one's gonna be far more rigorous, require a lot more work. The other one might be more fun, provide more electives, for example, because you have more free time. Um, it's kind of a challenge, right? What do you do? What do you not do? But these are just gonna be the course titles. Um, I might give a little detail in each course, but not too much. So let's dive into this. Okay, so the first class I'd recommend would be something such as Introduction to Stochastic Calculus or Stochastic Processes, okay? That should be the first one. Um, stochastic Calculus, Stochastic Processes are used throughout all of finance. So the typical teachings behind Stochastic Calculus are going to be mainly focused on derivative pricing, which is fine, but this needs to be tied into all the other areas of finance. Anything that's a time series is going to be a Stochastic Processes in finance, okay? So not all time series are Stochastic Processes, but the majority of them, probably almost all of them in finance are going to be a stochastic process. Understanding how they work, why they work, the statistical theory behind it, how to do the calculations in math to calculate the area under the curve for these is gonna be an important aspect, again, for derivative pricing, but also outside of derivative pricing. But a lot of people don't connect those dots. So that is a very fundamental course within itself. Uh, the second course I had to have here is going to be finance for quants. So yes, you still need to understand traditional finance. You need to understand markets, fixed income, capital markets, uh, right, equity, derivatives, and accounting. You need all of that. I don't think you should waste time taking uh, a whole list of these though. You should have one course that covers everything. It should be a crash course. Uh, again, the students that you're gonna filter out for this program should be very prepared in advance. This should be information I can easily teach you without a whole lot of headache. Again, it's traditional finance. It's not that complicated to teach for most people. Uh, the third class would be Stochastic Calculus for Finance. So this would be a Stochastic Calculus course specifically designed for finance applications. So you should have already taken Stochastic Introduction to Stochastic Calculus. Now you're gonna layer on a very specific course applying this directly to a lot of finance problems. You should be able to cover more material because you've already covered the basics of Stochastic Calculus and Stochastic Processes. And then next I would say a course on time series and Stochastic Processes. So you can call this econometrics if you want or advanced econometrics, I don't know. You can label it whatever you want here, but there needs to be a course here that covers time series and Stochastic Processes together. Uh, again, you need to have in more traditional statistical methods in this process, laying the foundation for time series models. Again, you can cover Markov models in here as well. Uh, but you need to tie together stochastic processes and calculus here 
into statistics, econometrics, and probability theory. And again, I don't see a lot of this in the industry, but it is crucial for actually building solid models and understanding what's going on behind the models. And then next I'd have a statistics for finance one and a statistics for finance two. So these are two separate courses. Statistics is the core foundation of all of quantitative finance. So it goes into derivative pricing, right? You're gonna be modeling out, for example, volatility. Again, you might be using stochastic calculus, but you're probably gonna be using models such as Garch models. These are all time series models, but they come back to the core of statistics and statistical theory. I believe there should be two separate courses on this, uh, a first one and a second one, layering on more and more advanced techniques that you'd use in the actual workplace. And then next I'd have data science for finance one and data science for finance two. I believe there should be two courses. Um, so machine learning, AI, data science, it's all kind of like the new trend, it's moving forward. We need to be prepared for that. There are a lot of techniques in these ones that should somewhat cross with your statistics courses, but having more tried and true machine learning methods, for example, like gradient boosting, random forest, neural networks, these things should be applied in here and you should have really, really rigorous depth on these courses. These should not be simple, easy, you know, here's some code, you run this, here's general theory, we're done and we're in and out in like, I don't know, a few weeks. So these should be rigorous. I don't see a lot of this in a lot of quant programs. Again, data science, machine learning, it's all being done in the new programs. I just don't see a lot of the rigor that it should be there. And then next, there should be a numerical methods course. So again, optimization, for example, there's a lot of problems in finance that aren't closed form solutions. Uh, numerical methods in general is a good course to have. A lot of the top programs have this course as well. Next should be computer science for quants. So yes, more than just coding, um, setting up, for example, your environments, working in your environments, looking at optimizations. Um, again, I'm a big fan of learning C. So learning like the Boost library, for example, this is more on the implementation side than it is on the quant side, but being able to code well, being able to code efficiently, having good computer science practices, which I drive home constantly, uh, is the difference between having code that is easy to validate and having garbage code that people are kind of using and no one understands how it works and it just creates headaches down the road. So computer science, an entire course on this developed, designed for quantitative finance. And then next, there should be a course on model development and model validation. Um, so this course is something I don't see. It's what I do for a living. It's how I define quantitative finance in general. You have people that develop models, you have people that validate models. Um, this is the basic process, whether you work at a quant hedge fund, right, or it should be at least if you have best practices, um, or if you work at a bank, it's the same process. Somebody builds models, somebody validates them. Uh, this course should be set up though, where it's divided into two parts. You should be teaching different types of modeling structures, types, and methods. Again, you should be drawing from all your other coursework with statistical you know, analysis from the stats finance one or two, depending when you take this course, as well as your data science courses. Um, but it should be divided into two halves. Half the class should be developers, half the class should be validators, and then halfway through the semester, you switch. So this should be solely focused on research, uh, building models for the development side, and then having a team validate those models and then switching them. Again, I don't know how you'd structure this because you'd need time for the development team to build models. So perhaps everybody builds models in the first half and everybody validates in the second half. Might be a more feasible method than splitting a class in half. Uh, but again, being able to really look analytically, tearing models apart, looking at assumptions, really getting into that analytical mind frame and challenging the status quo is very, very important. And then finally, I think there should be a research for quants course here. I don't see this a lot either. Again, it's an academic masters, at least the one I'm constructing here, you know, out of thin air in my imagination here, but I think it should be. Um, again, research, setting up like example experiments, testing hypothesis, looking at data, looking at data weaknesses. How do you build actual research projects, right? This is why a lot of these firms, banks, companies wanna hire PhDs over masters. PhDs have the research experience, and so you should have a course that's designed and laid out to talk about uh, pitfalls and areas where research can go wrong, as well as how to set up research. And this would play into the final piece of what I believe the curriculum should be. And there should be a quant finance thesis. This should be legitimate research for quantitative finance. This should not be nonsensical factor models, which I see everywhere as a waste of time. Yes, you did an OLS regression and you call it a factor model because that's what they call it in finance. Thumbs up for you, that's not real research. You need to actually do real academic, rigorous research in quantitative finance. So this is gonna kind of layer on here who I think should be involved. And this is where I deviate again somewhat from an academic master's and kind of cross over with that professional master's out there. Um, 
you need to have academic professors that are actually doing research in the industry for quantitative finance. There's not a lot of it out there. Okay, I'm just gonna throw that out there. There's not a lot. Uh, you need to hire faculty that's actually going to be doing research for this. At the same time, you also need to have industry practitioners as some of the professors and teaching here. Um, the reason for this is that academia is also in the dark a lot of times. They don't know what's going on in the industry. And so if you can kind of get these two halves to work together, you can have professors, again, that can provide insight on what the industry is doing. So you get that kind of cutting edge piece and also tie that in with some research. This would make for an amazing quant thesis. This should be real research though, guys. This shouldn't be like, hey, students come up with your own fun idea and like just submit a thesis and a paper and we'll grade it. Like that's a waste of your time, okay? Your, your mentors should have actual problems they're working on. Um, again, the academics and the professionals should also be doing research on their own for their own jobs, where they should have problems that you can work on and you should be able to work on them with them so you get real hands-on experience. And then finally, the last piece of this. So we talked about, again, at the beginning here, so summary, um, we talked about academic versus professional degrees. Again, I believe it should be mainly academic. You're gonna have some pieces of the professional masters kind of tied in there. You need those industry practitioners to really make this a feasible, uh, worthwhile masters, but you really do need that academic rigor. We talked about the courses that I would lay out, the ones I'd have you take. Uh, if you look at the course load, there's 12 courses. So I'd expect you would take three courses per semester for two years. Uh, your quant thesis, I would have kick in at the beginning of the second year here, and that should be layered on top of all your coursework and you should have to do all that work. So again, it's not really feasible to take four classes a semester and do a thesis. This is why I kind of recommend that you actually look at, um, again, a two-year program. It should be two full years. Uh, again, a lot of students might actually start their thesis at the beginning of one year. It depends on what's going on, the skills you have, how much value you can add to these research projects. But again, it should benefit the person doing the research, so your professor in some ways. Uh, it should also benefit you though on the learning side. And then to wrap this whole thing up here, right, we've had what we have for the coursework. There needs to be professional mentorship and there needs to be career services, okay? This is all under one umbrella or it should be. Um, again, you need someone who is a professional at placing quants. You can't hire past students to do this. I've seen it. Some people do okay at it, but most of them don't do very well. It's hard to play students. You have zero network contacts. You don't know what the industry is looking for, right? I could ask you, oh, are you hiring a credit quant or an operations quant or like, I don't know, a derivatives desk quant? Like, what are you hiring here? And they wouldn't really know the difference here. And then not having those network contacts makes it challenging to place them. And part of this career services needs to be that these people that are involved in this process need to essentially groom these students to be ready for the industry. So my whole channel, right, fancy quant, focuses on the quant side, but also the fancy business side, well presentation, right? Dress in at least a button up shirt, have a vest, a jacket, something, be prepared. Um, again, grooming these students, you need to train them how to act with professionals. This is one thing I think that is quite well in the MBA programs and a lot of the professional degrees is they train you on how to actually interact and work with the industry professionals. This makes interviewing a lot easier and a lot more successful. There should be entire courses that are required. It's not an additional course though, right? It's like an outside of your academics, but it's a requirement. Um, I would have them, for example, in like the evenings. They wouldn't necessarily be every week, but they'd be maybe, I don't know, maybe once every two weeks, something like that. They should focus on writing resumes, interviewing, how to dress, how to act, how to respond. And again, it would be nice to bring in industry practitioners into these seminars as well. So you can get the language down of how do you talk about quantitative finance um, from your classes in an intelligent way. And again, trying to tie in that research thesis piece that you've done. Um, again, making that well-rounded person so people really wanna hire you. So anyways, that's kind of my takeaway what I would do to build a quantitative finance master's. That's what I think it should have in it. Um, again, this is just my opinion. So you can ask people out there, other people have different opinions, but that's what I would do. So anyways, thanks for watching. And as always, until next time.